I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about miscarriage and loss. And this is something, I think we have that magic date at the you know 12 weeks where we feel that we can share with people that we, we are pregnant. And maybe if we have a miscarriage before that date, we haven't shared, we haven't shared our happy news, let alone if we have a miscarriage to be able to share the, the heartbreaking um, news that we've, we've, we've lost our baby. So I wanted to dig into this, how we can potentially reframe the experience of miscarriage and loss what to do in the stages of grief, what that looks like for miscarriage and way, and if you may be stuck in certain stages of grief and how, how to navigate that, that part and really yeah, how to reframe the experience of loss and miscarriage and what that would look like if you looked at it completely differently. Feel free to grab your partner with this one. Although with miscarriage, we would typically talk a lot about women, but this equally impacts your partner So uh, definitely listen to this episode together and feel free to leave a review on iTunes. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. I just, I completely lost it. During my miscarriages, and especially my third, I was just, you know, completely brought to my knees. It was like, like I was T-boned by life. Mm-hmm. So it's like I was just driving along, and this pain just kind of T-boned and leveled me, and just told my car. And that's just really what I felt like it was like. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, and my mission is to inspire, motivate, and empower you. Most of all, I want you to wake up. So with functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today, I'm welcoming Jackie Figueres to the podcast, and we're digging into how to navigate miscarriage. Jackie Figueres is the founder of The Supported Mama. She's a master's prepared registered nurse, clinical educator, and certified professional coach. Jackie's passion is around coaching women who are struggling with painful process of trying to conceive. She specializes in infertility issues, miscarriages, and grief, focusing on mental and emotional well-being. On a personal note, Jackie struggled with fertility issues for years. She had four consecutive miscarriages, including her daughter's twin. Her journey created a deeper passion to change the landscape of healthcare and the fertility journey for women. Check her out on thesupportofmama.com. And before we jump into today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Jackie, excited to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here, Sarah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so if you could share your journey as to really how you came to do this work for us. Yeah, oh my gosh. I'm just, I'm so happy to be here to be talking about something that's just so personal for so many, and especially me. Mm -hmm. So I've been, you know, in the medical industry for about 20 years. And I really love it. And I'm so happy to be part of that world. But, you know, on my journey and my academic background, it only got me so far. So what happened was, I really feel like looking back, I just, you know, took fertility for granted. And, you know, I just thought it would happen for us when we were ready. And even after my first miscarriage, I thought, okay, you know, this is common. I knew the statistics. And so I thought, okay, unfortunately, we're part of the statistic. But after my third miscarriage, I really was just rocked to the core. I mean, I was working with a reproductive endocrinologist at that time. I had done everything right. I am that A plus student, right? I followed my treatment to a plan and I even got pregnant with the first IUI. So, I mean, I really felt like I nailed it. So when when we found out that that third baby also wasn't viable, I just, I completely lost it, you know? And here I was just someone who was surrounded by all this knowledge. And, you know, I understood stages and I practiced a lot of self-care techniques and research as much as I possibly could. But yeah, I went through a horrific time. You know, I had this dream team and had every resource known to man around me. I'm a nurse. My husband's a nurse. Almost everyone we're surrounded by are nurses or doctors. But during my miscarriages and especially my third, I was just, you know, completely brought to my knees. It was like, like I was T-boned by life. 
Mm-hmm. So it's like I was just driving along and this pain just kind of T-boned and leveled me and just told my car. And that's just really what I felt like it was like. And, you know, having three miscarriages and then finally had a pregnancy that looked like it was going, you know, to go to term. And I was pregnant with twins. And then we lost one of our twins too. And I just realized that I just, I wasn't equipped at all for, you know, everything that was happening and especially how I was going to deal with actually having my child in front of me. And that there was this whole trauma that went into that thinking too. And like, oh my gosh, is she more vulnerable? Is she going to die too? So I was, there was just all this mess. And even though I had this amazing support system and I was luckier than anyone else I knew, I just, you know, had all this academic knowledge in my head and all these resources. But I thought like, oh my gosh, if I feel this way, if I'm struggling this much, I really feel like I have to help others who might be struggling to conceive as well. And so that's really what led me to create my coaching programs and the support of mama. And I'm just so passionate about this because, you know, I feel like it's kind of like that rock that people don't look under. And it's something that we just don't talk about enough. So I'm just so thankful to be here and to be a part of this and be able to help anyone out here who's listening. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing your story. And really that image of being T-boned by life, that that's quite a powerful image. And so obviously people listening to this podcast are dealing, dealing with infertility and potentially dealing with miscarriage and loss. So I wanted to take this episode and really dig into some some strategies and things to help them as they, they navigate this time and, and talking about miscarriage. So uh, first of all, can you give us some stats around, around uh, miscarriage? Yeah, so it's going to be a little bit different for countries. So <laughs> I don't know all of the countries. Mm-hmm. Um, in the US, one in four has a miscarriage and one in eight is diagnosed as being infertile, which is 12 mm-hmm. months of trying without you know, yeah. having a baby. And I believe in Canada, it's one in six. It was mm-hmm. the most statistic. Yes. For infertility, okay. I'm like, you can help me out there. <laughs> yeah, as far as for, for miscarriage, so one in four, yeah, which twenty five percent is is a lot, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so let's let's take us through the stages of grief as it relates to a, a miscarriage and really what that looks like. Because I think a lot of times um, for people doing the miscarriage, they may not even. First of all, if you're not, you haven't told anyone in the first, mm-hmm. you know, before the first magic twelve weeks. You may not even yep. have a support system available. And then when you have a miscarriage loss, then who do you reach out to? So let's kind of go through the stages yeah. of grief and what that looks like with miscarriage. Absolutely. And you nailed it. So much of what's difficult with grieving. I mean, this is such a misunderstood process for so many. And you nailed it with so many times. People haven't even shared it yet, right? So something so beautiful has happened and then suddenly is you know, taken away or is lost or whatever phrase you want to use. And it's very confusing because now how do I talk about it when I didn't even get to share the joy with people and now I'm sharing the sadness. Talking about the stages of grief, um, you know, so many of you are probably familiar with the Kubler-Ross stages, right? Which is that denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And, you know, throughout my research, my own experiences, just really realizing that grief is just not linear and you go in and on different emotions throughout your journey and really throughout your life. There are times where we're going in and out of those phases, but it seems to be very different for those who are struggling with infertility and then those who, you know, have had miscarriages as well. So, you know, and, and the interesting thing is the difference in how people feel, right? So we're, we're talking a lot about the people who are feeling devastated over it, but there's others who aren't that devastated and that's okay too. There's this, am I grieving correctly, right? There's this pressure where am I doing this right? Do I feel that the right way? And so I think, um, you know, really learning how you feel is what's going to be the most important thing. And sometimes that's the most difficult part because people don't always recognize miscarriage as a true loss. You know, I remember getting asked so many times, how far along were you? Seems benign, not very hurtful, but to me, it just felt like the length of time mattered. Like, Like the length of time determined the value of my baby or how sad I was supposed to feel, right? that impacted like, am I too sad now? (laughs) Right. So like if I lost my baby early, am I too sad? Or if I lost my baby later, was I sad enough? So there's so many societal issues that go into grieving miscarriage as well. And, you know, what I really just love to focus on is that, you know, there's that very popular saying, we grieve because we loved. And that's really the bottom line. That's all that matters is if you loved your baby, then there's grieving that needs to take place. Right. Again, like we were talking about, no one else may know. So the stages become even more obscure and you kind of just like walk around in this fog and this pain that's just inside of you and no one's talking about it. 
you know, so it's not like when you lose your mother or sibling and everyone sends condolences and hugs and flowers and food, and you're just surrounded by this love, right? But when you miscarry, it can be really isolating and confusing because you feel the same way, but no one else really knows how to recognize that loss. And so it just adds into all these mixed up, confused feelings of, am I supposed to feel this way or not? And so, you know, I just say you're just in the state of confusion. Um, And so that can be just really challenging. You know, when you're thinking about, you know, do I even know what this is and what am I supposed to do? And it just gets really overwhelming. You know, when I think about it, I I use this image because this is what I would feel like. I haven't traveled to a lot of countries where they don't speak English. And so what I kind of felt like was I was standing in this bus station in a different country. And, you know, you're supposed to, you know what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to get on that, the correct train, but you can't understand anyone. You can't read the signs. You don't know who to ask help for. Everyone's moving fast around you. They all seem to have a clear path and it's all just spinning around you. But you, you're just like stuck and you can't move. You know what you're supposed to do, but you just can't do it. And that to me is oftentimes what grief feels like when you're you know, trying to grieve a lost child or miscarriage. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, a complete overwhelm, kind of like what is happening? Everyone's going on with their lives and I'm over here and no one knows. And how do I tell anyone? And I don't even recognize me or yeah, all these. Yeah, it's it can, yeah, overwhelm and confusing. Right. And the good thing is that you don't stay in this way, right? You don't mm-hmm. stay in the spinning in this train station forever. So you do go through different phases. I, I don't know that you go through those exact stages. Thankfully, you don't get stuck in that train station forever, right? Mm-hmm. So as you really learn how to grieve, and I say learn because grieving is not innate. <laughs> and that was something I had learned the hard way that you really do have to learn how to grieve. And as you learn that really sharp pain, that overwhelming and confusion does lessen and your baby becomes part of your story instead of you know consuming you or defining you. Yeah. So what would that look like? So if we're following like the, the regular stages of the, of the denial, anger, you know, bargaining acceptance, uh, I think I missed one in there, but like, what would it look like then? Is it more? Yeah. So again, I'm not someone who personally loves to go through the specific stages. I think denial is definitely one that is very common because I mean, gosh, even when I was having my third miscarriage, I was like, no, we're staying on the medications, right? I was with my reproductive endocrinologist and I was like, no, there might be a chance. There's a chance that this could change. And so I think denial absolutely is because you love so much and you want to do anything to think of that's going to happen. I know people and some of the women I've worked with get stuck in anger Mm. and they don't actually move out of anger. They might look like they're functioning normally in society and going through their day, but their go-to emotion just is anger. Anger with themselves, anger with the world, anger with God even sometimes. I mean, anger seems to be one that really takes over is the hardest one to move forward through. For sure. And where is, um, yeah, where's that kind of showing up? Do you think like, what does that look like? If someone's in anger, they're just pissed at everything or like, we're like, yeah. Like, and it won't be at, to us. Yeah. And it won't be at everything, right? They look normal on the outside, right? And I say normal with, you know, air quotes, <laughs> but that person who might get really frustrated or be short, um, irritable, right? So things that you can think like, oh, okay, that person's having a bad day, right? But that's mm-hmm. really that anger that's just festering inside of them. So it will come out maybe their temper is a little bit shorter or uh, their anger is making them feel more isolated. So they start to go away from people because they just feel angry all the time, which can show up as bitterness, right? So they start isolating themselves more. And at the bottom of that is anger. So, so oftentimes when you can start to work through that anger, you can start to peel away those layers and then start moving into some of, you know, acceptance is tricky because I don't know that you ever accept that you lost a baby. But mm-hmm. what I always say is moving forward, being able to move forward, being able to not have it consume you and to to think of your baby as part of your story instead of this just complete devastation that takes over everything in your world. And the bargaining piece, what would that look like? So bargaining, definitely, probably, uh, that one probably comes up like off and on and off and on and off and on in the beginning and the middle and the end, like constantly, like, because again, most people who are trying to conceive are going to try again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I do all of this right, it's going to happen. If I pray harder, it's going to happen. If I eat everything right, change my diet, do every single thing that the experts are saying, it's going to happen. If I have a child, I'll never yell at them, right? So you start going through all these and it's true. I mean, oh my gosh, just the different things that you think about because you're so desperate to have that dream come true. But that one is one that um, I don't, I feel like it's difficult to move past that one because you're constantly hoping and wishing and dreaming 
and bargaining is your way to think that that's going to come true. Yeah. Each month going over and over yeah, and over again. Exactly. So anger. So it, and I love that you said each month and, and that's definitely, I, I used to think of it in a different term analogy as month or a year or whatnot, but really it's like a week by week. So the first week you're super hopeful again, right? You're like, we're mm-hmm. going to do this. And then the next week you're like, Ooh, okay. So I'm, I'm pregnant until proven otherwise. Right. So then you're in this like super elated, happy stage. And then things start to change and you start to panic. What is that symptom? What is this? What is that? And then your cycle starts and then you start to get angry again. And then you start that bargaining all over again. Okay. So this month, this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, depression is sprinkled throughout that as well. So to me, it's this roller coaster and it's this more of this like really messy ball of yarn. (laughs) It's not this linear line of I go through this phase, I go through Mm -hmm. this phase because it's, it's every month for someone who's trying. So that's why I just picture this ball of yarn where they're all intertwined and they're coming and going. And until you really learn how to really work through some of those emotionals and some of that trauma, that ball of yarn is really hard to untangle. And what's the other one? So denial, anger, bargaining, acceptance, I'm missing one. A depression. Depression, yeah. Which I so said is, is sprinkled. Is that, yeah, well. so that's kind of in, in there as well, obviously, be it situational in this case, or if it was clinical from beforehand. What's your experience mm-hmm. then with the depression, what you're seeing, or maybe if you have a personal story of that or anything you want to share? Yeah. So depression is interesting because depression can show up in different forms as well too. So some people, so like for me, what I would add into here, if I made my own Jackie Figuera stages, <laughs> I would add in anxiety. I think depression is something that can manifest its way in multiple ways, but anxiety and depression are very separate, although they get lumped kind of together and they can create one another, right? So to me, I think that anxiety is what really starts to come up. The sadness and the depression is for sure there are people struggling month after month, getting those you know big fat negatives and just over and over and over feeling like you're just on this hamster wheel, nothing is changing. But then there's this anxiety of, of feeling like I talked about that pressure of what can I do to change it? How can I do that? And for me, that I think is what really took over was um, having that intense anxiety, um, which then you know, really manifested itself postpartum. And so that was when things really shifted for me. I had my miracle. Why? What are you talking about? I should just be elated and happy. And like, this is what I dreamed about forever. And to have postpartum anxiety where people really didn't talk about that. People don't talk about postpartum depression, but postpartum anxiety isn't even a lot of, um, uh, providers don't even have a questionnaire for it. They have the questionnaire for depression, which manifests itself very differently from anxiety. So in that 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 buildup month after month after month of putting your body, your emotions, your hormones through that trauma, it all becomes compounded. Whether it's compounded grief, compounded anxiety, it all starts to build on each other. Back to that anger and the bitterness. And then that's really, mm-hmm. then you will go into that isolation piece and that's where yeah. we really do need connection. So what's what are some during that stage, how do we, when we're feeling in that, like s- stuck in there, and like, as you say, bouncing around to different stages? Yep. And I think, you know, for people, sometimes silence and isolation is comforting, even though it's not healthy, it can be comforting at times. And what I really, you know, encourage people to do is start to look within themselves and figure out, you know, what it is that they can start to do, being aware of what they're going through, when they're starting to really retreat, when they're feeling all that anger and they're just not. Sh- Sure, right? They're still figuring all this out for themselves. And, you know, we, we do a lot of this where we talk about, you know, being able to reach out for help. How do you start to speak up? Because it's very scary to talk about. It's, it's very difficult to be vulnerable. It's very difficult to be vulnerable with everything, right? People just, we tend to protect ourselves. But when you're dealing with the thoughts, it's really difficult. And so what's, what I have found to be really helpful is letting them learn when they're ready to start to speak up letting them learn how to ask for the right support and how, what does support even look like is a huge deer in the headlights. When I ask that question, you know, Sarah, what does, what does support look like to you? What would support look like from your husband? It's very difficult to start describing those things. So really get into that nitty gritty deep into that so that they will recognize it when they receive it, right? Because so oftentimes we say, oh, I don't feel supported. No one else knows what I'm going through, but how are we showing up? Yeah, that's Can be a lot so of times being able to set boundaries and asking people yeah. like how you want it to, what, what do you want? And we haven't even thought exactly. about what we want. And so we haven't told people. And then when they do something that we don't like, we're, we're upset and triggered, but it's like basically, yeah. it's not telling the world, but it's like telling a few close right. people, wait, when 
you know, if, if there's a baby announcement or if there's whatever may, it may be, you know, mm-hmm. I want you to handle it this way. And it yep. can feel a little scary to be uh, that bold right away. But that's, that's how you then go, wait a minute. Yeah, that's what I really want. You're asking for what you need. Exactly. And boundaries is so key. That's actually my next point. So thank you. You led perfectly into that. <laughs> because I think we think when we start to share, it's like this wide open door. Right. And so what I like, it's just, you can, sometimes you can just creak that door open a little bit and maybe peek out, right. You don't have to have it wide open and, and unleash and, you know, letting everything out. And so really setting those boundaries for what it is that you want to share and how you want to share, because there is this feeling of like responsibility. Once I start sharing that now I have to answer all the questions and it's like, no, you don't. You set the boundaries for what feels good for you to share. And you set the boundaries for what questions you're comfortable answering. And so, so much of that is that empowering the woman to own themselves and to own what their experience is and to really feel confident in what they're willing to share, what they're not willing to share. And then reaching out starts to feel safe and not so scary. And as we know, reaching out and sharing your story can be so helpful. You and I both obviously mm-hmm. share our stories and I'm sure for you, it's been really healing. For me, it's been very therapeutic as well, but that can be so hard when you're in the thick of grief. And so just, you know, dipping your toe in the water, creaking that, you know, door open and setting those boundaries understanding how and what it is you want, what does support look like? Those are all those really key things to help you come out of that isolation and to not be so stuck in that anger stage. And the male, the male partner is equally hurting as much as the female partner. And so what would we, what are some, some tips to help, help him deal with this? Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you brought this up. And I, myself, sometimes, because I do coach women, I do partner work as well, but you know, it's so easy to go straight to the woman because she's one physically Mm -hmm. who went through it, right? And the man oftentimes, as you know, takes on so much more of the weight because he is also taking care of her, whether it's physically, whether it's emotionally, he sometimes is the speaker on behalf of the couple, right? So the woman can handle it. So the man steps up and starts speaking on their behalf. And, you know, it's so interesting as I'm learning more and having more men speak up other than just my husband's experience, that they feel the same they're going through so many of the same issues in a different way. And for them, it's sometimes more difficult because they don't in general talk as much, right? Mm -hmm. Don't reach out as much. And they have the added weight of taking care of another person besides themselves. Yeah. I think sometimes they think they need to be strong, but they've lost a child as well. So it is to be for them to reach out for support and yeah, not just be the the support for the, for their, their partner, but that they can get support. So yeah, when you're doing some couples work and stuff, are you as well? Yes. I love doing the couples work. Um, the, the men have, you know, they've been a little hesitant at first, but I reassure them a ton that I'm not going to get all foo-foo on them. That's like the, the common term they want to use. And I'm not a foo-foo person. So I set their mind at ease, but there's almost this sense of relief. And I'm sure you've probably felt that as well too. I know you work primarily with couples and there's almost this sense of relief that you feel come over them, that someone is showing them that compassion and someone's speaking to them about their their feelings too. And it's a very safe atmosphere, right? It's not with their buddies having a beer where they're going to feel like, I don't want to be vulnerable, but it's like they can really open up and and start to share some of those experiences. And with my partner work, I really focus on making sure they're on the same page with all the different experiences and feelings that they're going through. I do like scaling questions with them and have found that to be really helpful in so many aha moments and so much love and connection occurs during even just a quick 60 minute session. It's so powerful. Yeah. Cause sometimes the partner may not even know what the other one's going through. They might not have even have voiced these feelings before. So it's the first time you're hearing that, that they're hearing this and it's like, Hmm. Okay. Yes, exactly. I have them sit in separate rooms. They have their own pieces of paper. They answer them privately and then we share them together. And it, they're like, oh, I thought it was this. I had no idea you're actually feeling this. Those are some of my favorite sessions. I actually really love the partner work. And then so you talked a little bit about this, but so for, for silence, so why is that the worst for someone who's grieving? Yeah. And you know, that's, I love that such a common question that I get. And it's not so much about like silence is the worst, but you know, like, oh, I see everybody posting now and celebrities are posting more. And if you go on Instagram, my gosh, there's just this amazing fertility support on Instagram. I want to share, but I'm not sure how. And so I think with silence, what's, what's so harmful about silence is again, like we talked about, it creates that isolation and that's what's harmful and being silent continues for you to feel alone 
and, you know, just trying to figure out how do I start to open up? You know, I think I, I hit pretty heavily on that earlier about, you know, creaking that door open and really just making sure you're ready. And, you know, one of my clients, she was like, I think I want to talk about it more openly. She had just a small group of women that she had been close with. And actually one of them is someone that I know, an acquaintance. And she had her first miscarriage eight years ago. And this acquaintance called me up and said, Jackie, what are you doing with, I'll just say Kathy for lack of a better term. Uh, What are you doing with Kathy? She hasn't told me anything in eight years about her miscarriages. And last night she talked for three hours straight. She opened up to me and poured everything out. And I have my friend back. And that was just an amazing thing that I was able to have that, you know, feedback from someone else. But then I followed up with my client the following week and she said, oh my gosh, Jackie, I couldn't believe it. Once I started opening up, I like, I couldn't stop. So she started really picking and choosing who she was going to open up with. And that anger started lifting, that isolation started lifting. And she started to feel the support she was looking for was clear and she was receiving it. And it was just really allowing her to start to move forward and to not hold so tightly on to those unhealthy but comforting feelings that she had just clutched to for so long, right? You clutch to anger because it's easier than sadness. Mm -hmm. Not healthier, but easier, right? Easier to be mad than to be vulnerable and sad. So what are some things we can do for ourselves or for someone else who's experienced loss? Oh, I love this question. So this, when I really started coming out, my number one question I get texted, get asked on my blog post or get asked on my site was, how do I help someone who's struggling with fertility or or what do I say to them? Or if they've miscarried, like, what do I do? And so I actually have written two different um, posts on this topic because I was asked this so much. (laughs) And I love that because it means people are more aware and they want to provide support. Like they're getting it more like, oh, I feel like I should be doing something instead of, you know, previously everyone kind of almost ignored it because it was so uncomfortable or they just know what to do. So I love when people are reaching out. Um, so yeah, so one of the posts that I wrote about was how to avoid hurting someone who's had a miscarriage. And so it's really going through some key phrases that, oh my gosh, people are so well-intentioned, right? They don't realize that some of the things that they say are so hurtful, like the, how far along were you? Mm -hmm. Like that's crushing, but they don't mean it that way. Or, you know, just some of those, so I go through those different phrases and why they're hurtful. So someone can avoid those and be like, oh, okay, here's my list of like, make sure I don't say these things, right? (laughs) But then I wanted to follow up with that. So I wrote a post on 10 meaningful ways to support a friend after miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And that is packed with real practical information, like show up and offer to clean, right? Because people don't realize like there's a physical issue with miscarrying too. It's not just emotional. You're physically going through very painful experience. Showing up and bringing food or offering to help fold laundry can be go a really long way for those, you know, close friends. And so giving some of those real practical information, simply saying things like, I'm sorry. And, you know, the number one thing that I share with people is just treating the person who has had that loss the exact same way you treat anyone else who had a loss close to them, right? Because to that person, the pain's the same. Sometimes more amplified because they didn't even get to meet their loved one. And so it's this like ambiguous feeling of, I didn't even get to get that far. And so that's probably the number one thing I say is when people text me, what do I say or what do I do? What would you do to someone who lost their mother? Do the same. It's no different. The grief is the same. It feels the same for that person. Mm -hmm. To acknowledge the death of the baby. Exactly. And so, you know, so that's the first part of the question you asked, but what do I do if I'm someone who's experienced loss, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm struggling and I'm listening to you, Jackie and Sarah, and I'm like, okay, so I recognize that I'm stuck and I'm feeling so just lost and confused and overwhelmed, but so what do I do? And so one thing that I really realized, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier before, is that I just realized I didn't even know how to grieve. And that was one thing I had to really learn how to do. And in really trying to figure out like what was going on with me, why was I so sad? Like I felt like after my third miscarriage, it was like, whoa, I see other people around me. I didn't have a lot of people, but I had some people around me who were miscarrying and they just didn't seem so seemed, right? Overwhelmed as I did or so devastated as I did. And what I realized for me specifically was I hadn't really grieved my first two losses. After my first miscarriage, I literally went to work three days later. I didn't know any better. I didn't even understand what was going on. And then with the second miscarriage, I rode in a bike marathon. I mean, it was crazy. Like two weeks after my miscarriage, I just didn't know. I know, oh gosh, there was the worst thing. I was supposed to ride a hundred miles and I did 50. And even that was like amazing looking back. But um, I just remember crying through the whole bike ride. I couldn't keep up with my group. 
I was there just crying tears down, riding this bike and just like looking back, like, oh my gosh, I want to hug that person so tightly and just be like, get off the bike, go take care of yourself. But I just didn't yourself type A, like, go, go, go. We must never, (laughs) yeah. Never admit that there's anything wrong or what, what do you think? Yes, totally. And so many of us are type A, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was, I didn't know how to grieve. I didn't really understand like what was happening. And I feel like that's so often the case with miscarriages is you're just like, again, no one talks about it. So you're like, maybe I shouldn't feel this sad because nobody else is talking about it and feeling this sad. So with my third miscarriage, you know, that's when um, I just really was like, I need to figure out what's going on. And what I realized was I started doing research. I research a lot. I think I've mentioned that a few times already. Mm -hmm. And I came across an article that talked about compounded grief. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wasn't at the time (laughs) and I'm like, Oh, what is this compounded grief? And what I realized was because I'd had multiple miscarriages and I hadn't really dealt with them because again, I'm going to keep pushing through. I'm strong woman. And I'm going to, this is just part of it. I'm going to go through it. I realized like, Oh, wow. I really hadn't grieved. And uh, so I just, I really realized I needed to learn how to grieve and that I needed to really understand what that even looked like. So I started doing just so much research about emotional awareness and how do I know if I'm really sad or if I am angry, if I'm going through these stages or like, what is going on? Like I just started really digging in and being aware of your emotions and how they're impacting you, just how important that is. Because without that awareness, there's no way you can begin to move forward. But so much of us, we don't take that time, right? We just go through our days. We've got lists and lists and lists of to do things we have to get done. And so we just kind of trudge through our day and, you know, it's at the end of the day that you start to realize like, wow, I'm really sad or a pregnancy announcement comes up. Like something will smack you in the face and just throw you for a whirlwind or every night you're sad or every morning you're sad. You know, there's different times of days that seem to really hit you. And so what I started realizing was I needed to work on my emotional awareness. And so this is one thing that I think has been really helpful. And it's one of the first things I do with my clients is walk them through an exercise. So if we have time, I would actually love to walk you and our audience through an exercise. So if everyone can grab like a a piece of pen and paper, and I'm going to go through some categories. And this is just increasing your awareness of what you're feeling like on a typical day. So you can choose your worst day if that's going to be helpful for you, because you really want to know like, gosh, when I am feeling at my low. And so for those of you who might be listening that, you know, haven't had a miscarriage or aren't going through fertility, you can also do this to manage your stress. So you could, you could change this to how stressful am I during this time? For those of you who are going through fertility and miscarriage, you're really going to think about how sad, how angry, like what are those emotions that you're feeling? So the categories is going to be personal development, spiritual awareness, fun and enjoyment, and relationship has two points. So it's going to be intimate and social, health and aging, your personal finance, your career, job, profession, whatever that looks like. And then the last one is family parenting. And so I want you to look at these categories and kind of go through them. And again, think about a typical day or a low day, whatever is going to really help you understand your, you know, your typical emotions that you're feeling. So you're going to do a scaling of one is like, you are feeling like crap. You can barely get out of bed. There's just no energy towards that part of your life whatsoever. Or there's a lot of anger and frustration and you're just like, I'm done with this. That's going to be your love, your number one. And 10 is going to be, I'm feeling a lot of energy towards this. I'm feeling very happy towards this. I can say, I feel joyful about this. So as you go through each category, you know, put your numbers down of one through 10. So when you're thinking about personal development, you know, how am I improving myself? What work am I doing? Am I doing any disciplined self-care? You know, how, how, it, how effective am I at that? That's going to be your personal development. You know, spiritual awareness doesn't necessarily have to be religion. So you can think about different types of, of things that you're grounded in with spiritual awareness. Fun and enjoyment. Are you experiencing any of that right now? You might even want to feel like you want to put a zero for that and you can and then relationships. So why I break it down into intimate and social, because how are you socially connecting with others in your world and then intimately? So those really close friends and, and your significant other, because those can be two completely different situations. One can feel healthy and supported and the other one can feel not at all and vice versa. And then health and aging, how are you taking care of yourself? Especially right now, you might be hyper in tune with everything. And, and again, that bargaining, going through everything to make yourself super healthy, or you might be partaking in things that are not very healthy because you're just frustrated and burnt out and just done. So you're starting to kind of do some unhealthy habit. 
personal finance. We know that's a reality. Mm-hmm. Infertility is not cheap. So how is that impacting? What are you feeling about that? And then career. One of the things I, I hear so much when I talk with people is, well, everything is great in my life. It's just, I'm struggling to have a baby. And then when we really dig into it, they start to realize where it is impacting the career, the profession, their ability to focus, their ability to move forward in projects and really keep up with everything. And then the last one, which can be really difficult during this session is family and, play- and parenting. You know, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, I do a so, similar sort of a circle of life with my clients yeah. as well and being able to sort of pinpoint it and then you can make some yes. goals to work. And just because you're low on something doesn't mean that's where you want to focus, but um, right. it gives awareness to that. Because sometimes when you're you're going through it, yes. you're like, oh, wait, I didn't really know that my yes. I have joy. So you have fun and enjoyment that my joy was at it too. Like how, mm-hmm. or you, you, mu- you might have known, but when you see it on the paper, it's like, oh, wait a minute. And then, you know, right what's something to acknowledge that and being able to make some, some steps and it doesn't, and maybe even looking at that head on is, Mm -hmm. is difficult. So it's like, you kind of come at it from the side a little bit. Yeah. And I actually do this in a wheel as well. So I actually hand the wheel to my clients. So I love that you said that because the wheel lets you know how, where your big, um, you know, cause you think of a wheel and that perfect circle of a wheel and how you can't move forward when you have these dents in your wheel. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's the first time a lot of people really like, look and dig deep into this because again, we're busy, we're going through, sometimes it's that avoidance. So taking the time to really think about this and this really segmented way of your life brings aware so much awareness. And like you said, it doesn't always mean that this is the first one we're going to start on your lowest one, but it gives you just that snapshot of what is being impacted by your grief or your stress or your pain. Yeah. And we, I see a lot with the social side of things where people have, you know, cut themselves off from their friends and family. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, I can actually start to to look at that again. And, oh, I like going out with, you know, and it doesn't necessarily need to be the same people you're with before, because maybe if they have a family or they have kids, that's just too triggering. But it's like to say, wait, where, where can I reach out to people? There's people, as I kind of say to people, there's people right, like, with you like all the time. So where, like there's someone staying probably right there where you're like, Oh wait, I could, I could reach out to that person. And a lot of times we think it's, think we can't bother people or whatever it may, may be, but to, you know, to make the first move. Oh my gosh, you bring up such a good point. The, I feel like I'm the Debbie Downer. I am sure you've heard that numerous times too, where because things are just month after month, really difficult, that then you start to feel like, well, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer and I just don't feel like talking about it or they don't get it or, you know, all those kind of stories that we play in our head. And, and when we start opening up and recognizing where these, you know, areas of our life are impacted and how meaningful they are to us, we start to let even that one person in as, as was the example with the story I shared. It's incredible how it can start to just open your mind and your heart to what else is the possibilities for your journey. Yeah. So the shift, because a lot of times we're not, we don't, we're not aware that we're thinking these thoughts. So like 99% of the thoughts we think we have today, we'll have the same ones again tomorrow. What are we saying to ourselves? If we're stuck in that anger loop, we're stuck in that whatever loop we're, we're in, but it's going on and on and on. And so to be able to first step is to be aware of what we're even saying to ourselves. Yeah, exactly. So one of the analogies I use, and again, I'm clinical, I'm a nurse. So this is like an analogy for me. But for me, it was like, I was watching myself bleed, right? And I knew like, oh my gosh, I'm bleeding. And I have to stop this bleeding or I'm going to bleed out. But I didn't have the ability to operate on myself, right? And so I needed to to have some of these tools and these things that would start to, to, to put like, you know, a gauze on my wound. Okay, right. So that's the first step. So trying to just help me figure out what those steps were and realizing that I couldn't do it all on my own. And some of it was just simply increasing that awareness of where I was at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how did you reframe your experience with um, miscarriage and loss? Yeah, this is, oh my gosh, this has been uh, just completely life-changing for me. So over, you know, gosh, so what was this? Four years ago, since my last uh, miscarriage was my daughter's twin and seven years since we lost our first baby. And, you know, there's still things that trigger you. Like it just, it never completely goes away. Um, But, you know, the, the work that I've done on myself and the work that I get to practice with my clients, you know, I know enough now. So when I get triggered, 
And, you know, I know what that looks like now. And so I kind of know how to move forward. And, you know, so I think about, um, do you remember like, well, maybe in stories or whatnot, <laughs> but you can think back to like those old um, style Apple cards, right? So, I mean, we, nobody has them anymore, but, <laughs> but I think about that because I think about when you're stacking those apples on there, right? And you stack them higher and higher and higher. And then the whole apple cart just falls over and the apples go everywhere and they're rolling down the hill. And, you know, that's how I used to feel in the beginning and before I really learned how to grieve and it was so overwhelming. And now what I feel like is like maybe one or two apples falls off the apple cart and I'm able to, you know, pick them back up and, you know, I can feel what I'm feeling, but it doesn't feel overwhelming. And I don't go into this, you know, complete downward spiral recently in this past year, I really dove so much deeper into really understanding grief, you know, really trying to make sure I can be there for my clients and what, I experienced for myself was so life-changing and I'll try to keep this short because it was this incredible experience. And now I'm able to share this with my clients and it's just amazing. But what I realized was that I still had some residual pain and I didn't think I did. I'm like, I'm a coach. I do all this. I get triggered, but I move on. But what I didn't realize is that when I would still think back to my babies, that I only ever felt pain. I never felt joy or happiness or warmth. It was only just heavy weight and pain. What I did was I, when I went through just completely trying to change my mindset, went through a series of questions and connected really deeply with my heart and was able to be in some very specific situations that allowed me to really connect with my babies and realize that I don't have to see them as like gone or that they're lost, that I can still be their mommy. I've never seen it this way. I'm not that type of mindset. I'm very you know, clinical, very medical and to feel this connection with them and to realize that like they're around me and that I can still love them and that I can think of them more as my guardian angels. And, you know, now I can even, I'm sure you can hear the change in my tone. Now, when I think of them, I actually feel like joyful now. And I still sometimes can't believe it. And I feel them and that they're with me and it feels so good as opposed to so much pain. And it's just such a powerful and incredible shift. And it's the greatest gift I've ever received. And it's one that I'm on a mission to like share with anyone that I can work with because it has literally changed so much of everything in my life. Yeah. The power of the mind and really that, that shift from pain to, as you say, to knowing they're around you and then love and comfort and um, feeling warm. Right. And I had it almost be like in a, in like a meditative state, like really calm, mm -hmm. quiet, really opening my heart, opening my mind, letting go of my brain being like, this is weird, you know, because mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. some, some people who are super into that, they can jump into that state really well. I think too much and overanalyze everything. So I had to really just let go of all of that. And when I did, oh my gosh, it, and I, I just, I put my hand on my heart. And I want to think about it because I'm just I'm able to connect with them so easily now. That's what's an anchor when you feel that emotion. Where do you feel it in your body? And so for you, it's in the heart. So feel to anchor Absolutely. that. Yeah. It used to be in my gut because it was ugly and it was painful mm. and we hold a lot of stress in our guts, right? And it would be heavy and I'd be nauseous. And now it's this light, warm feeling in my heart and it's just, it's incredible. Beautiful. Well, thanks for sharing that. So you, ha is there anything you'd like to, that you're obsessed with right now? Be it a book or a website, an app, a documentary, <laughs> anything you're digging? Hmm, which research? <laughs> yeah, <I'm kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who do this, we research a ton. I think I mentioned it a bunch. There are a couple um, books. So obviously me, right? Go to the supportive mama. But, <laughs> but there are a few books who um, like just really spoke to me. And again, it's so cool to be part of, of this community because you start to read books that may not be main shelf, but wow, do they speak to you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Life After Miscarriage by Shelley Meddling is amazing. It's a quick, really quick read, but it's really personal and it's really easy to relate to. And she's just like real and you read it and you're like, oh, this person gets it. And it starts to really like, if you're feeling alone, definitely start with that book. It is amazing. Infertility and PTSD, The Uncharted Storm by Joanna Flemons. Again, really helpful with understanding and acknowledging that PTSD is real with mm -hmm. women with infertility and miscarriages. That was something that I didn't understand. Like I have PTSD because I think of PTSD as like military right? And to be like, oh, wow, no, I really am traumatized and I am terrified my dad's going to die every day, right? So this book really hits heavy in that. 
Um, Life After Baby Loss, a companion and guide for parents by Nicola Gas- um, Gaskin is also amazing. And then anything by Zoe Clark Coates, right? I mean, <laughs> if you're not following her, follow her, saying I mean, she is so gifted in her messaging and um, uh, her images and everything. I mean, she has this beautiful image and I can't wait to recreate it of her with her children and then with her angel babies also in the, in the picture. And I think that one just anyone who's lost a child is like, yes, that is, that is what I want to relate to. So Zoe Clark, um, there's so much. what's her last name? Oh, Zoe Clark Coates. C-O-A-T-E-S. Yep. And okay. saying goodbye org is her site. Oh, is it? Okay. And then she also has a book called baby loss guide as well. So I'd say I'm probably pretty obsessed with her more recently in the past year and a half. Great. Well, th- yeah, thanks for those uh, recommendations and um, success story. I think you've shared a few. Was there anything else you wanted to share? Um, no, I think I, I went through quite a few of them and <laughs> I know we have to be mindful of the time and everyone else's time was listening up there as well. <laughs> and so you have a free um, download for the listeners. They can go to the, the support of mama.com and they can have, so it's a guided meditation. So how to cl- uh, calm your mind, energy and frustration on your fertility journey. And then it's, so it's 15 minutes. So what can they expect there? I am someone who like, I, I like in my fantasy world, I'm like this amazing meditation person, right? I can sit there and <laughs> I can just totally be open and all that. But as I mentioned before, my mind takes over and I was looking and doing a ton of research. I love a lot of the apps, but I was looking for something that was really specific for fertility. And I wanted to provide something that was free. Some of them I, I found um, you had to pay for. And so um, I created this 15 minute, it's, it's kind of like a body scan imagery, a guided imagery. And the feedback has just been incredible because I focus specifically for anyone who struggles with infertility, anyone who's had miscarriages, going through your body, figuring out how to, you know, sprinkle in some affirmations to love yourself. And it's, it's heavy, but it's profound what you can do in 15 minutes. And I tried to keep it short. I know everyone is so busy but the feedback has been phenomenal. Um, you know, so many emails from people just saying, you get me. This is the first meditation that really spoke to me as someone struggling with fertility. And, um, you know, my voice quality, I don't speak like this. I'm much softer and, and the music in there. It's just all meant to be very warm and nurturing, but really help you um, come out of it in a different mindset. I love that. So Jeff, definitely go to the, the sport of and then you said, just click on the where do they go there? They just click on the... There's a drop down that comes up within like two seconds and you just um, fill out your name and your email and it comes directly to you. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey there. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.